Um, hi, everyone. Good to meet you. Uh, I'm very excited to share our recent work today on hyena DNA, which is a new class of foundation models and in our application to genomics. So a little bit about myself. I am a fourth year PhD student at Stanford. Um, I'm a part of this research group called Hazy Research, uh, which is a classically machine learning computer science group led by Chris Ray. And one of the things we've been focusing on lately is on how to create better foundation models. And this has looked like a couple of instantiations. One thrust is on how to create faster, more efficient uh, architectures, or excuse me, uh, versions of transformers. And so it, it's, this looked like uh, flash attention for those of you familiar. This is the world's fastest implementation of the standard attention algorithm, about five dynamics uh, faster than something like PyTorch. And then I work on particularly uh, what we call art alternative architectures. These are models that perhaps can go beyond um, what transformers are capable of in terms of efficiency, and in particular for long sequences. Uh, a couple of these models are iterations. One is based on S4 or state space models. But today we'll be talking about Hyena, which is uh, a convolutional based model that we'll be diving into more depth um, into. One of the things that we observed when we started working in this space was that there's been a lot of focus on long context models. The idea that uh, there's a limit on how much input you can feed into these foundation models or large language models. And a lot of these use cases have been applied toward natural language or, or code, computer code, with a number of companies setting out targets and milestones. We also noticed that there wasn't much attention being paid to these long context models for biology, which has some of the longest sequences out there, right? So something like the human genome has 3.2 billion base pairs, um, but the models that are typically used in this domain are on the order of two to 4,000 context length. And so there's just somewhat a huge mismatch, right? In terms of capabilities and, and needs for, for this space. And so we thought maybe we can apply some of our models that we've been working on in our lab to this domain and maybe have an outsized impact. And we're particularly driven by the potential for impact in this space, right? Not just you know, making cool models, but if we can have more expressive long context models, we can help with potentially understanding disease better, drug discovery or target discovery. And this concept of personalized medicine, we're, we're also pretty intrigued by. So if you can imagine something like ChatGPT, that could fit in context an entire human genome in its prompt. You could potentially query that genome for potential diseases, uh, maybe you know, predict drug reactions, but ultimately guide treatment options based on someone's specific genetic code. Uh, this, is, you know, this seems very powerful and something that we, we hope to make possible at some point. So taking a step back, um, this project, this, this uh, work is focused on the field of genomics, which is a study of all genetic material, including structure, function, and evolution. And yeah, as we started, you know, diving into the space and getting a feel for some of the challenges, we, we did kind of uh, summarize a couple of things that we noticed, right? So again, what's this separation of context length that um, typically is um, needed in genomics, right? Much longer than language or even protein language models. Now there's also this concept of resolution. So when designing foundation models, you need to use typically some kind of tokenizer to essentially choose the granularity or what's the smallest representation for your data that you want to use. So for language, this might look like uh, uh, you know one word per token, it might be subwords. For protein language models, they'll use uh, character level, right? So one character equals uh, an amino acid. And in genomics in particular, you have this requirement or ideally a need for both long range and high resolution uh, in your data representations, which makes it particularly challenging, right? And so things like SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphism um, kind of show where this high resolution really matters, right? Potentially. So a SNP, a single SNP, a single character change in DNA can alter genes, traits, functions, or disease state. For example, you know, a single base changed uh, in the right position can mean the difference of having sickle cell anemia or not, right? 
Oh, we got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, are you okay to take questions during the presentation? Or? Yeah, I think um, clarification questions would be great, and then we'll we can leave longer discussions, perhaps to the end. Sure. Yeah. So, because you are at yeah. that slide when you're talking about personalized uh, genome. Uh, so, as we know, we have uh, two alleles. So, one from father, one from mother. I'm just wondering when you model the personalized genomes for, let's say, two alleles, how do you account for that? Like, you can account for one of the haplotypes, right? So, but then you have two alleles, you know. So, the sequence is not just sort of one, one sequence, it's like uh, two sequences right? for, for each individual. Sure. Yeah. So, just to clarify or, or to be explicit, we, we are not able to fit an entire genome into chapter TPT right now. <laughs> um, and so this is just potential that we think would be a very powerful tool. Um, so I'm just purely speculating, but uh, perhaps you can um, stack them with two different channels, uh, one, one, uh, one genome on top of the other, for example, to, to represent an entire person. Maybe, but fair, fair thing to actually see if that would work or not. Yep, thanks. Sure. Um, it, yeah, so in terms of previous methods, um, you know, we're not the first to use uh, genomic models uh, or foundation models in genomics. There's a, a line of work that we've actually, you know, largely followed in terms of their recipe, you know, pre-training on a large corpus, fine-tuning on a downstream set of tasks. Largely followed that same recipe, uh, but we notice constraints, right, when people are, again, are, are using foundation models of today's architectures for genomics, shorter context lengths that are constrained, Tokenizers typically look like BPEs, by pair encodings, uh, or KMERS, things that will aggregate number of DNA characters into meaningful subunits. Um, but you know, you lose resolution potentially because of this. The other thing is that we also notice some of these models, um, like the nucleotide transformer, for example, are, are massive, two and a half billion parameters. Um, and so we definitely wanted to address each of these, not just um, more expressive models, but models that could fit potentially on uh, you know, researchers who have limited budgets um, or folks in academia, right? We're not, not all uh, labs have, you know, thousands of GPUs. And so these are very much top of mind for us in designing uh, uh, high-end DNA. Now, also making sure that, you know, we, we ask the right questions. What, what are we even trying to learn with these genomic foundation models, right? Um, in general, we're, we're trying to learn useful and general representations from DNA sequences implicitly. And the assumption is uh, we're going to treat DNA as a language, you know, these foundation models for, for genomics will treat DNA largely as a language with the assumption, presumption that uh, there's an underlying grammar or some kind of syntax, right? So let's take, for example, um, a DNA sequence. We know there are regions that code for genes and that could be transcribed and translated into proteins, right? So there's informative regions for sure with some kind of syntax. Um, we also know that this, you know, these regions are roughly just 2% or, or less of the entire human genome. Um, and so there's actually a lot more of the genome that we're less, um, perhaps have less understanding on the exact mechanism, right? These are the non-coding regions. Um, some, some initially called it junk DNA. We now know that it actually regulates gene expression or, you know, decides when, where, and what amounts to make proteins or other biological products. Um, and so there's this interplay, interaction between coding and non-coding regions that's quite complex, um, leads to different things like uh, different cells, different cells, right, with the same set of instructions. You can have brain cells, heart cells, uh, liver cells, all with the same genetic code, right? But just being able to regulate differently um, allows you to make different biological products uh, or have different disease states. And so we look at it as, as a large combinatorial space of all these interactions in your genome. And uh, in particular, let's you know, look at one particular case of where these interactions might um, show up and why we're how we're trying to model them and, and why it's so challenging. So we have no DNA sequence with a couple of gene regions. Uh, a protein complex needs to, to bind to specific sites along your genome, RNA polymerase, to kickstart the transcription process, right? Now, whether that protein complex binds or not is can be influenced by a number of DNA motifs, right? Patterns and certain sequences in, in, in the genome will have the ability to promote, enhance, or repress whether that complex binds or not in changing uh, downstream function, for example. Some of these motifs can be very, very far, um, up to millions of base pairs away, 
um, like enhancers. And so this is where it can be extremely challenging to be able to capture not just the long range, but also all the interactions at different resolutions, right? And so this is the this is one of the challenges we want to be able to represent in a foundation model um, to learn all these interactions, right? And so folks typically start with the transformer architecture uh, for foundation models, right? And rightfully so. It's a very powerful, expressive model that's been successful, you know, in vision, language, and very, very popular these days, right? And and rightfully so. It, it is a very uh, expressive model in terms of its quality, being able to model these interactions, because essentially in a sequence, each position has the ability to um, have a receptive field that reaches pretty much everywhere in the in the sequence, right? It has this long range capability, um, but it comes at a cost in terms of time complexity, uh, which is a measure of computational efficiency, efficiency that computer science folks use. This is in contrast to a, you know, a key deep learning uh, primitive, the convolution, which typically has somewhat of an opposite kind of set of traits. Its expressivity is on the lower side because it has a local receptive field, right? It, it, it kind of looks at a smaller range of inputs, but because of that, it's much faster operation, typically linear time. Uh, depending on the kernel size, on the filter size k. And so the, in the original Hyena architecture work, which was uh, focused on language, um, we kind of asked, is there a way to kind of get, to get the best of both worlds, right? This expressive model that's much more computational efficient. And to do that, we distilled, our idea was to distill a couple key properties in attention to try to essentially reverse engineer what makes attention so powerful, but do so with uh, operations that are much faster, more efficient. So these two properties, the first one is global context. This is the, you know, I lose the idea. Um, so we have a sequence here represented by these, these squares or tokens, right? And the idea is that for each token, essentially what's happening is it's comparing itself with every other token in this pairwise fashion. And this is how you kind of model the different interactions in your data in the learned distribution. And it has global receptive field. So that's a very powerful uh, key thing that makes transformers so, um, so unique and, and useful. But you can see as the sequence length grows, grows um, this, you have the squaring law, right? So if your sequence doubles, the number of computation quadruples, and you know, et cetera, as you grow even larger, right? The other property that perhaps is less talked about, that is uh, something that we think is key to making transformers very uh, expressive, is uh, this concept of data dependency. So it's a data dependent operation. Um, so we have the attention formula on the bottom right, but rather than diving into the, the math formula itself, um, I'm gonna try to describe some of the intuition about what it's doing and why we think it's so uh, powerful. And the first thing that you do is that you, you take the input, you project it into these uh, things called the query key and value, and then you somehow mix them up to compare it with each other. And essentially what's happening is your, your model is trying to learn from itself, the, 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 the data input itself um, by doing similarity comparisons with the data. And so the operation is really dependent on itself. Um, the, the operation is dependent on the input itself. And so let's take an example where that might show up and you know, to be concrete about how that might happen. I like to use a, a language analogy or, or a visualization from translation, like let's say German to English. Uh, represented by these these boxes are words tokens. So initially we have you know all our German tokens and we're trying to decode English words one at a time in this autoregressive matter uh, manner for for transformers. And so initially the context right will depend on the German words. And at the beginning for English you have this thing called the start of sentence token. You know just basically a clean slate. And the idea is you're going to learn a weighted sum of the of the input of the German words. And initially it's only affected by uh, this context, right? But as you decode each new English word, that's fed back into the operation and that will change the weighted sum that you do on the German words. So you do this multiple times, the context changes, the weighted sum changes, right? So this is a very dependent operation on the input. Another way to look at this is to contrast this with an operation that is not data dependent. That might help folks give a sense, um, get a sense of well, you know, this data dependency. And we have a standard convolution in this example for let's say an image where you're striding a kernel left to right, top down. 
Now the convolutional kernel that you, you apply over the input remains fixed as you stride over the input, right? It's not changing based on the new input context. And this is the key thing that will, we'll, you know, that we're going to contrast with attention. Okay, so we've uh, talked about key properties, two key properties in attention that we want to um, mimic. And with that, we'll be able to design a hyena operator, a hyena layer that mimics that properties, those properties. Oops. And the starting point for us is the transformer block, right? So we're starting with a similar skeleton, which is made up of an attention layer and an MLP or multi-layer perceptron. We first remove the attention layer and also the positional beddings. We don't need them in. And we'll swap in the hyena operator. We'll keep everything else in the, in the block, which is the MLP and the residual connections for, for add here. And if there's anything to walk away about, you know, what's the hyena operator, it's made up of two key operations, which again, mimic the properties and tension, but do so with much more efficient primitives. So the first is what we're calling a, a long convolution. And this is like a standard convolution, uh, except the kernel is global. So the kernel is the size of the input. Normally your kernels are short range. So they have a local receptive field. We're making the kernel the same size as the input. So it has a global receptive field. The second to mimic data dependency uh, is the element wise gate. And I'll describe both of these uh, in more detail next. So zooming into the hyena operator, right? Let's walk through the hyena layer and, uh, and see how the data actually flows through, right? And how we use these two primitives. The first step is the input X. It's projected into three representations, much like attention at this point, with the same notation, the query key and value. We use the same, but, it, but we use it very differently. The main difference here is on top of uh, a projection being used by a linear layer, we also pass it through a short convolutional layer as well. That's a key distinction with, with transformers. We take two of those projections and we do an element-wise multiplication of the two. Now at this point, the projections are exactly the same shape tensors. And so the, it's literally each position is being multiplied with uh, a corresponding position of the other projection. Again, this is to mimic the data dependency, right? The data itself is being used in the operation. We, pay, we take that output and pass it through the long convolution, convolutional kernel with global receptive field. And I'll dive into more detail about that because uh, it is a special kind of kernel, take that output and pass it through one more gate. And in large part, that is the hyena operation. You have this option to repeat these uh, pairwise convolutions and gates to change the expressiveness or, or, or depth of the layer, but that's sort of optional. The more important sorry, thing I... is to dot. Yeah, oh, yes. sorry, go ahead. J j just one simple question. So the element-wise gate, uh, it is, a token-wise, uh, somehow, like a sigmoid maybe operation that computes some weights from zero to one, and then they are applied as weights to the original sequences to sum up. Or are you using, uh, like how these weights are applied to, uh, to sequences, keys and pages? Yeah. So at this point, you can kind of think of the outputs of each little layer. Um, so they're projected into a higher dimensional space. So you have something like something that's uh, the shape specifically is a batch by the length by the number of channels, right? So it's a three dimensional tensor. And so th that's the, you know, you can think of it as like a feature map or like something that's output from a neural network. Um, and they're all floating point values at this point. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, yes, but those weights, they are applied to the uh, original projected keys and queries, right? Or are you operating on them directly on floating points? Directly. Yeah, directly. Okay, I see. I see. Thank you. Yeah, good, good question. Okay. Uh, so, I, we're... can I ask a question as well? Sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like there is a very specific role of the short convolution there, which, uh, which you are like using to get the values as well as the gating like kq etc 
So does it combine information from nearby positions? Do you first apply the dense layers and then apply convolution? Yes. So, so order I'm, is dense then then short convolution. Here. So why it why did you go for short convolution then? Yeah, good question. So uh, without going into too much detail about um, sort of the design choices there, um, the main takeaway is that you can think of it as like a easy lookup table. So it's like um, the long convolution, the dense is, you know, aggregate information, the short convolution ensures that nearby things are yeah. especially paid attention to. And they, well, combine it, uh, information is combined, I think, with, between the nearby things or that's the thing. Yeah, hmm. yeah. All right, thank you. Sure, good questions, thanks guys. Um, so diving into this, this long convolution in particular, it's sort of the, the meat, uh, you know, so to speak of the, of the layer, um, because there's especially two things that make it unique, right? So the first is if folks are familiar with long convolutions or global convolutions, um, when you have a kernel, that's the size of the input, right? The number of parameters grows quite a bit. Uh, the benefit for you know standard convolutions is that there's weight sharing, right? So when you have a local receptive field, you share a lot of weights, and so it becomes a much easier task for your model to optimize. Uh, and so when you have a global convolution, that kind of goes away, right? And so we have some techniques to get to to overcome that. The other thing is that um, global convolutions are can be slow, right? So if you have a of a, a filter that is the size of the input, the operation actually reverts back to an n squared operation. In other words, it's just as slow as the attention mechanism. And so we're kind of back to square run if you just did the convolution standard naive way. And so we also take advantage of uh, fast convolutional uh, algorithms that we'll, we'll talk about as well. The first, so going back to this uh, parameter efficiency and, and uh, long convolution, the first, the first thing that we want to describe about what makes the long convolution for hyena uh, special is that it's an implicit convolution, implicit long convolution. And this is to overcome, again, the parameter efficiency. And we want to compare this with what we're calling explicit convolutions or standard convolutions, right? So let's say you had an input of the size of uh, a 1 million. The number of parameters that you need per, per channel, but just number of parameters that you need for that input is also 1 million. And as you grow that input, the number of parameters is also gonna grow. And this is what makes learning intractable sometimes for these models. Um, and so the idea is to decouple those two. Regardless of the size of the input, we have a fixed parameter budget that will somehow make the kernel. So this is the, the idea that we have a separate function that will parameterize the kernel, no matter how long the filter, no, no matter how long the input is, we can have a kernel the same size. And so, and therefore you have much less parameters. How do we do that? We actually use a separate neural network, a mini neural network, or, or in other words, an MLP, just the number of dense layers, activations. And the idea is we're going to tell the, this MLP, this little you know, filter function, what size input we want. So you know, feed in the index positions for the size of the input, let's say a thousand, and the MLP will spit out the weights to the kernel that we want. It's not the final output of the convolution yet, it's just the weights of the convolution. We then take that convolution and, and then, can, then can apply the convolution um, over the input. You know, it's a, it's a different kind of concept that kind of tripped me up when I first learned about it. I, I have this analogy to help um, give people a sense of like, you know, why are we having this roundabout way of doing convolutions? Let's say you, you want to define a very long line on a 2D plane, for example. One way to define that long line is to describe the coordinates for every point explicitly on that line, right? You'd have a lot of coordinates. Another more efficient way to define that line is to learn just a couple parameters, right? The slope and the intercept. And with those two parameters, you're able to define an arbitrarily long line, right? As long as you want on the fly. In this analogy, uh, the long line is the, uh, the very long kernel for hyena and the parameters, the, you know, the parameters here, uh, for hyena, it would be the neural network, a mini neural network. So hopefully that gives people a visual about, you know, why we are doing this implicit function. And going back to this, okay, you have a kernel that's very efficient, but you still have this slowdown in terms of the long convolution, right? We take advantage of a key convolutional theorem. 
So folks who are familiar with signal processing, right? Um, this states that a convolution in space or time, a, a normal convolution, is the same as a multiplication in the frequency domain. They're, they're equivalent, right? The key difference is the time complexity of a space convolution uh, is n squared, but the convolution in the Fourier domain, that whole algorithm, lets you to reduce the time complexity to n log n. So something near linear or log linear. And so this is what we use to speed up our uh, mixing of convolutions uh, over the sequence space. It allows us to have a much more efficient operation. So that a lot um, of complexity is there. But... Yeah, please go ahead. Um, so I think with your design decisions, the running time complexity is n log n, but memory complexity is o n, right? Um, memory complexity. Um, that's a good question. I, I is it, is it, is it, is it, I'm not sure exactly, but it, it is subquadratic yeah. also. Uh, I forgot the exact time complexity, Definitely. Uh, space complexity, but um, yes, we're also subquadratic in, in space as well. Uh, that's a related I, question I have uh, about the time complexity. So this is a forward pass, the time complexity for the forward pass. So now when you do backdrop, is that still a log n or is uh, it's more than that? Um, also good question. Uh, it should be also subquadratic in, in backprop as well. It is, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But that's a good question. <laughs> you guys are asking very good questions that um, <laughs> haven't been asked before, but uh, yes, I, I think that's something I can certainly follow up with just to be sure, to just make sure I don't say the wrong, uh, you know, to be exact on this, but, but in general, um, it's going to be subquadratic both in forward and backward paths as well. Thanks. Yeah, I just had a question about um, the pre-processing and input for the convolutions. Um, so are the, are the sequences or the subsets of the sequence being selected so that the um, convolutions are not like uh, splitting across codons? We we don't take any additional prior information in the convolution it treats every input uh, roughly the same i suppose yeah so there's no there's no special prior knowledge about separating between coding or non-coding ranges or codons or or anything like that yeah okay yeah at this point um i wouldn't think i wouldn't describe the model as having uh an inductive bias that's geared toward genomics in particular think of it as a generalist foundation model at this point Cool. Yeah, I think it's not very tailored to genome language modeling at this point because of the long convolution parameterization. So it, I believe, like there is a lot of room room for improvement there because, you know, your model currently high DNA does not use any genome related domain information such as fun, like, um, maybe this is a relevant question. So how does your the weights predicted by your long convolution parameterization distinguish between different positions. They are like only dependent on the time index, right? So they are only like learning time related. Well, yeah. Am I, am I like? Yeah. So, yeah. So, that, so one thing, right, we remove the positional embedding. So uh, the thing about convolutions yes. is that it has this inherent spatial structure already. And so that's why we remove the, the, the positional embeddings. Um, and so what it has a sense of is relative spatial um, or time mm -hmm. in, a, in a sequence. So it does already have that natural bias, I guess. Yeah, but um, still like it does not know about variations, the locations of variations, the locations of transcription factor binding sites, like the, the no. could you go back to like the time index to weight part? One? Yeah, this one. So, yeah. like the there are more features other than index positions. That's what I'm trying to say for the MLP in order yeah. to process DNA sequence. Yes. So, so just to be clear about what this part is doing, this is just a function to come up with the kernel convolution weights, right? So Definitely. at this point, we just want to know how we should parameterize a, a filter. 
it's the filter. Once you have that filter, you can apply it over mm -hmm. the input and that's where the learning happens, mm -hmm. right? That's where it learns from the DNA itself. At this point, it is agnostic. It doesn't know what it, the input even looks like, right? It's just knowing I'm at position one. This is the weight for position one. So I uh, just want to make that clear. But I'm saying clear. it should be. It should be because like the different positions in the genome have different properties. Some are in gene regions, some are in non-coding regions. And like, I believe your convolution, non-convolution parameterization function, the MLP, should at least consider some of the domain related information, at least in the first, like hyena layer. Uh, I'm maybe going a little bit forward. Sorry for interrupting, please. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, yeah, so maybe just to give some uh, thoughts on this, like, so at this point, you know, maybe it's a design choice about what kind of model you want to make. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the good thing about foundation models is that you learned in an unsupervised way, right? You don't have any, any labels at this point. You're pre-training yes. on a bunch of, uh, of corpus so, or in this case DNA. And so huh. um, it's a, you know, relatively cheap way to pre-train a model. And so at that point, you kind of let the model learn on its own, basically without, you know, extra information, without any prior expertise. Um, and mm -hmm. that's kind of the, the, the general foundation model framework, I suppose. Um, yes. But for sure, if you, if you uh, there's always room for improvement about how to inject inductive bias, the right types of domain knowledge, right? Now that's ongoing research that is worthwhile doing for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for the, thank you for the thoughts, everyone. Um, so, so armed with the hyena operator and um, understanding how it's you know using long range and also um, fine range fine fine grain um, information. Let's talk about the experiments to train uh, hyena DNA. So the first step to create a foundation model is to do the pre-training step. Right, this is a self-supervised learning task to implicitly learn their interactions. Right, and we start with the human genome as our data set, the human reference genome, and so we sample randomly. Uh, a chromosome and a given sequence from that chromosome of a specified length. And the, the simple task, like a very simple task at this point, is given that sequence, predict the next token in that sequence, right? So this is uh, the simplest of tasks, right? Like definitely no domain knowledge of DNA uh, at this point, right? But we've seen how powerful well, that, that framework is. It's a bidirectional, like genome sequence is bidirectional. So you are doing next token prediction, for example, like if you are feeding the sequences from left and predicting the one at the downstream, it's going to miss out on the information that is beyond that nucleotide because they also determine the identity of that nucleotide. So how are you like, are you flipping the sequences during training to like, you know, remove the bias of the direction or are you doing anything regarding? No, nope, we're not. So you're not. Or... Yeah, I agree. At this point, it's unidirectional. Yeah. And so, um, Certainly room for experimentation on other techniques, Definitely. but at this point, just a sequence, predict the next token, right? Mm -hmm. And you do this over many, many batches, many iterations over the data. And the idea is that your model through that simple task is going to learn the distribution of the data. So presumably to better predict that next token, it's going to try to model those interactions in the data that we talked about, right, in DNA. We can then take those representations and apply them, fine tune, to downstream to tasks that we might care about in genomics. And so we have a number of experiments on the short, what we call the short range tasks on predicting regulatory elements, right, in their function. And then we have some longer range tasks to predict things like chromatin profiles or what we're calling long range species classification. Uh, if we have time, we can talk about um, the in-context learning experiments that we did too. To, to, it's essentially a very powerful technique in language models to um, adapt to new tasks. And we wanted to see if we can do that in genomics. The first step, again, the pre-training, uh, we, we didn't do just you know, a, a single pre-training of a large model. We trained a family of, of models. And so we wanted to see the training dynamics as you vary the number of depths, the width of the model, right, the embedding dimension. And importantly, what happens when you vary the sequence length? What do you, what do you gain as you increase the sequence length? right? One way to measure performance of the pre-training is the perplexity. Perplexity, think of it as the accuracy of how well you're predicting the next token in a sequence, right? Lower perplexity is good. We have perplexity here on the, on, on the chart here. 
And what we're doing is we're varying the sequence length uh, and seeing what the complexity is uh, at, at, at the end of training. And what you observe here is that uh, as you increase the sequence length, we're able to achieve better complexity, meaning we're able to predict the next token better. So this, this is telling us that the model is able to use that context to better predict what's the, the next token in that sequence. And so we're able to you know, vary this across a number of different model sizes uh, and eventually be able to train a model that has a million tokens as context, which is um, something we're pretty excited about. It's about a 500x increase over previous genomic foundation models trained on the, on the reference genome. Uh, and so can we're hopeful I, that... Yes. Yeah, go can ahead. Can please ask, ask a question? Have you tested yeah. uh, on the whole uh, genome? So the problem that I see here is that genome, as you may know, as you know, uh, has a lot of repeat, repeats and uh, different transposable elements. Essentially elements that are trivially predictable from FFT filters and so on. But also it has some regulatory elements, especially in gene bodies that are hard to predict. So uh, are you testing heat perplexity for the whole data set? Yeah, so good question. So we do have some variations on this. Um, for the most part, it's you can consider it the whole genome. We do use, um, we do like remove some extra uh, like parts of the genome. We, 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 practically speaking, we're using um, the intervals from the Bass and G data set or like the informer paper. So it does remove some like tail end uh, parts of the sequence that cut, like, I guess they, they thought it was like non-informative. So we, we also follow the same set of intervals essentially. And so, um, you can think of it as some parts being removed for like, if it's been curated to like remove like non-informative areas, like interpreted to be non-informative. Um, but there's, there, that's one way to do it. There's certainly ways to pre-train it. You, you can also just pre-train literally on entire genome for like randomly. Um, and that's probably just a fine idea as well. We somewhat scrub the data, so, so to speak. Uh, okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so, One thing we also did, we measured um, the efficiency, right, in terms of runtime. So you have a chart here that shows the uh, runtime and log scale, both in time and, and sequence length, for a forward and backward pass uh, of a small model. So this is a proxy for you know, you know training efficiency time-wise. Um, and so what you see here is the sequence length as it grows, the time to do a forward and back, backward pass will grow, but they grow at different rates, right? So for transformers, you have this n squared. Um, for hyena DNA, you have this n log n that I, I mentioned before. Main takeaway is that as sequence grows, right, the separation grows even more. This is in log space, so the separation doesn't look as, as dramatic. But um, you can already see at a, at a million context, um, million sequence length, that's about 160 times faster than, than transformers, in particular the flash attention algorithm, right, the very, very fast um, algorithm. OK, so then how does it work in actual downstream tasks, right? But, after pre-training, you want to evaluate on downstream tasks via fine-tuning in this case. Uh, the first set of benchmarks that we do are on the short-range tasks uh, of the genomic benchmarks. Uh, eight data sets at this point still short-range, so around 500 to 5,000 nucleotides, not especially long in, in our capabilities. Um, but already at this range, we can see a difference from baseline model, which is a CNN, and um, a transformer baseline. Uh, of all similar parameter sizes counts. Uh, and there's a fairly wide margin on, on these models. Um, at this point, we're not testing out the, the long range capabilities. We're just testing out, does Heine DNA work on you know, classic standard benchmarks in genomics? Um, did you fine tune Heine DNA or is it soft prompting? This is fine tune. For most of the experiments are, are standard fine tuning. We have, yeah. I see. Uh, a more challenging set of data sets uh, is from the nucleotide transformer, a uh, recent foundation model for, for genomics that was released this year. Um, the notable thing here is, uh, you know, these tasks are, are much more challenging. They're predicting things like enhancers, uh, histone marks, slice sites, and it's a sequence level classification. So given a sequence, predict these functions. Uh, the nucleotide transformer, about a two and a half billion parameter model um, using the BERT style, this bi-directional that um, that someone mentioned before, right? Uh, and uses k 
right? So a couple of key distinctions in terms of their model, right? That are, that are different than hyena DNA. Um, and so transformer and hyena DNA, they're both this like causal style, like this unidirectional single nucleotide level um, tokenizers, much smaller models. Main, main takeaway here is that um, we're able to, you know, surpass on a good number of data sets and, and match performance on others um, with a model that's 1500 times smaller in terms of parameter counts. So just one and a half million parameters uh, and using only one reference genome versus the over 3000 genomes that um, the nucleotide transformer used. So although, right, Hyena DNA has this um, principally different type of convolution where it's causal, um, it's shown to be quite powerful in genomics, even though it doesn't have perhaps the bidirectional that some people wish it to have. <laughs> um, uh, yes, again, sorry, just one uh, question to clarify. Sure. Uh, here, uh, the metric is accuracy or uh, precision. So, so essentially, uh, those uh, uh, yeah. regulatory elements, those uh, histone modifications, they are um, reported well as peaks. Yeah. And uh, also, my question is, what are you doing with uh, nucleosome? Uh, well, okay. So you essentially are using some uh, um, aggregated profiles from uh, something like ENCODE probably. So essentially this is a distribution of uh, those modifications, not, not like a uh, one fit sample. Yeah, so, so in this particular set of data sets, uh, it's been curated to have labels, classification labels. So they're usually binary or three-way. So it's like a true, true or negative uh, sample. Um, so it, it does have like a discrete label in these cases. And the metric is, uh, we have it kind of highlighted on the bottom here, uh, the Matthews correlation coefficient for, for the majority of them, uh, data sets, and then the F1 score. So these are different ways to measure the ratio of, of true positives and, and, and false positives and true negatives, et cetera, but very, very correlated essentially with accuracy, uh, but just different ways to come up with the, mm -hmm. the metric. Okay, uh, just the main question is that uh, you're predicting those uh, uh, potential modifications on the entire sequence, not only like on specific regions. So your model Correct. has a vast, uh, okay, great, thank you. Yeah, these are, yeah, sequence level at this point, all, all the tasks um, actually in this set of experiments are sequence level classification. So not, 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 not per base at this point. Um, can I ask one more thing before? So, <laughs> sure. Um, sure. Yeah, I'm very interested. That's why, like, I am throwing yeah, those great. questions. Yeah. Um, so you are saying it's 1500 fever parameters, but you also decrease the pre-training data. Like, uh, could, yeah. did you yeah. see if there is an effect of increasing pre-training data with this fever parameters? I mean, instead of using like 3,200 times less, for example, using 800 times less, would it give more performance to your experience? Yeah, fair question. We, we did not. So in this you work, we, we focus on pre-training just a single reference genome. You know. mm -hmm. Also, there's a... But budget constraints, right? Com compute constraints, so... Definitely, um, definitely. Um, also, like, you know, if you are randomly selecting regions from genome to, like, do this pre-training, uh, it might be biased towards like um, variation regions. I mean, large, there are large variations like repeats in the genome. Like there are blacklists, for example, ENCODE published a blacklist. Like if they have a blacklist, like the regions to exclude from their analysis. So if you, I don't know if you like treated all the positions in the, in the genome as equal to get the pre-training data. Um, did we you, did, yeah. We we, we treated all, virtually all equal. Um, I see. Yeah, there's, I think there's a whole. There's certainly a, a huge amount of value, in in machine learning techniques that are data centric, right? Curating data to Definitely. decide on how to feed data to your model, the right samples, and when. Uh -huh. um, we we somewhat use the naive approach, um, for sure. But there's, <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of research, a lot of interesting questions that could be done on that front. Um, for sure. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Um, maybe for the sake of 
time, I we can save um, questions for for the end. Um, but you know, I, I really appreciate the questions, and I I hope uh, I get to all the things that you guys are interested in. Um, okay, so some have asked, uh, especially reviewers during this process, <laughs> um, where does the performance gain come from? Like, right? Just you know, you show you show some interesting numbers. We you know, let's try to understand and tease apart some of the things that have led to better performance. And so in this case, we have some ablations, right? For one set of data sets, uh, we're training from scratch here uh, for the hyena DNA. One key thing that's worth mentioning, um, we swapped out the, K, the, the single nucleotide resolution to, for a KMER tokenizer. So we wanted to see, you know, if you use a KMER tokenizer, what happens, right? For hyena DNA. Uh, so we observed quite a big performance drop just from that one switch, which, which tells us that the single base pair resolution matters quite a bit in terms of uh, these downstream tasks. Um, and so we also tried uh, a bidirectional implementation of, of Hyena as well. Um, and in this case, we, we didn't see much change slash somewhat deteriorate, deteriorate, deteriorated um, performance on these short range tasks. Um, it's noteworthy that there's multiple ways to implement a bidirectional version of this. This is one version that we found that um, didn't quite convince us that we needed to do this right now. But we, you know, in follow-on work that we're planning to do, um, we're hoping to bump that up to, to get even more gain with bidirectional version. Um, something else that we thought was really interesting that uh, was worth mentioning, there's another way to measure efficiency, right? You can measure efficiency in terms of to get similar amounts of performance. How much pre-training did you have to do? How much data, how much you know, GPU hours did you need to get a similar, similar level of performance? And so this case, we're comparing the nucleotide transformer. Um, you know, we were quite, quite competitive there. Um, the amount of resources is just vastly different and we wanted to share that. So you know, the, that, that model trained for a month on 128 GPUs, whereas Hyena DNA trained for an hour and a half um, on a single GPU. It was able to surpass on a number of on data sets. Okay, so we talked about short-range tasks and efficiency. Let's look at the long-range tasks, right? Um, which which can be challenging for uh, you know finding data sets of this of this type. So one of them we do, we did was on long-range species classification. So it's, it's a task that we um, sort of made up, quote unquote. But intuitively, what we, we thought was interesting about it was uh, it allows us to separate what happens as you increase context length, like very very controlled way. So the idea is many species have similar types of DNA in their, in their genome. And so to be able to, let's say, classify or distinguish between them, um, the longer the context, the more expressive the model, right? The more uh, ability it has to, to be able to see the differences between the species. And indeed, that's what we observed as we you know, started with short, short range uh, sequences to classify uh, five different species. As you increase the context, performance goes up. You also see this occur in, um, Transformers, the main difference is, right, uh, it's transformers are computationally bottlenecked by long sequences. And so they're unable to do, do so in a reasonable amount of time, essentially. Um, this is also standard fine tuning uh, at this point for, for, the, for folks who are cur um, curious about that. Okay, so um, do we have time to talk about this? Um, maybe I'll just brush over this quickly, but we also, experimented on different forms of uh, adapting to downstream tasks. One way we did that was with um, a method used called soft prompt tokens or soft prompting. And this is borrowed also from natural language. And the idea here is um, we're going to take a frozen pre-trained hyena DNA model. And instead of fine tuning the normal way, right, we're adding weights to the, to the model like, like a linear head, we're going to add learnable tokens in the sequence itself. Right, so the model's not changing the sequence. We're just going to attach an arbitrarily long number of tokens that can be learned or tuned to the input, and feed that into the model. And the idea is that those those learnable tokens will guide the output of the frozen model to predict the task that you want to predict. In this case, you know some kind of function classification. And the idea is, um, it's a much simpler way to fine tune. Essentially, you don't have to change the model. Right, you're 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 adding everything into the sequence, and so you're um, it's it's you know you don't have to touch the model, no model surgery, for example, 
And then what we saw is as you, as you add more tokens into the sequence, this learnable tokens, uh, the performance goes up, right? So this is this kind of led us to believe that um, this is a promising line of, of work that changes how we kind of interact with these models, um, for example. And it can be especially useful for things like generation, right? Like if you want to prompt on what you want the model to generate, you can just kind of add these learnable tokens at the beginning. So that seemed kind of exciting to us. Um, yeah, we have some visualizations in the paper about you know what these embeddings are trying to learn in terms of the embedding space. Like they, they do end up separating in terms of um, different types of transcripts and and and, and genes, um, and that they you know with much smaller models are able to learn embed useful embeddings that can separate in this embedding space. Uh, you, you can measure separation by uh, being able to classify. Can you classify from the embeddings better than other models? Uh, and we have like F one F one score to measure that. Okay, so I've talked a lot about you know experiments in this paper. Um, I thought it was also fun to talk about you know future projects that might be suitable for for this type of model. Um, but, you know, we think it'll work well on a number of discriminative tasks um, that that you know folks in genomics might care about more than what we showed in this paper. But things like gene expression profiles, um, like the informer model, for those familiar with the DeepMind work, uh, or other types of things like uh, histone modification and chromatin accessibility. Um, you know, also things that that take advantage of long range. These are the discriminative side. Another type of uh, uh, set of tasks that we're also excited about that perhaps is less explored uh, is the generative side, right? Can we generate regulatory elements uh, in a controlled way? Uh, and I'll talk about a couple of, of things that we've been thinking about as well, uh, based on DNA miniaturization, which we're which what we're calling. So this this concept of regulatory elements. Uh, and generating sequences. Imagine if you could uh, prompt on something like a natural language text that says, you know, generate a sequence that will activate in, in a gene to its maximum expression level in cell type X, or a sequence that activates a gene in the liver and heart, but not in the brain. Uh, and then have the model, you know, finish the sequence by generating a DNA sequence, right? Um, also, you know, you don't have to prompt on natural language, it can be prompt on gene expression profiles, right? And be able to generate a sequence that will generate or that will uh, cause that gene expression profile. So think of it as like a reverse informer task, right? So that would be pretty powerful if we could do such some type of model. Um, there's another task that we've, we've been thinking about um, that we thought was quite compelling uh, that we were calling DNA miniaturization. Imagine if you had a, a very long sequence in the megabase scale, that had some kind of desired function or, or fitness, just you know, arbitrarily. Is there a way to package that into a smaller payload, right? A smaller sequence? Presumably, you can do that for um, gene ex gene therapy, for example, right? There's in gene therapy, there's limitations on how much uh, genetic code you can inject to to you know treat a disease, for example, or or an illness. Um, with this task, you can potentially have a similar function, but in a smaller payload. We thought this was interesting because in, in natural language, this task is quite simple in terms of learning that mapping from a sequence to a sequence. In genomics, the challenge is more on the data side. Does that data set exist? If it doesn't, can we create it? And how much would it cost, right? Those are the key questions. But we've, you know, we think that would be a quite a compelling use case for uh, a model like hyena DNA. And with that, um, I'll close with a quick summary. Uh, we presented a hyena DNA model that's a genomic foundation uh, model with long range capabilities and also single nucleotide resolution. Um, and, and in this set of tasks, was able to show um, you know, strong performance on standard benchmarks. But the real question is, you know, does this work in the real world? And so we've, we've made a number of different artifacts public um, to help folks you know, try it on their, on their problems if they're interested. Um, we have like a, introduction tutorial to even show you how to fine tune a pre-trained model. All the weights are public as well. Um, and a little community on Discord to help, you know, stir up brainstorm ideas. Um, and we'd love to hear feedback from folks or um, ideas on how we might be able to support their, their problems uh, or their challenges in, in, in tasks. Um, and so with that, thanks so much guys for, for the interest and, and listening today. Really appreciate it. All right, I've got some questions. Um, I guess uh, I, maybe I'll just kind of go down 
the list as I see them. Uh, Phil, nice to see you. Hey, Eric, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good to good to see you. Uh, like honestly, awesome work. This is super interesting. Um, thank you. I had a couple of questions. Uh, one, I was wondering. Uh, it's really cool to see like this long sequence task. Uh, like where your uh model, you know, really you're able to find like a a domain where you're really able to excel with the long range sequence context. Um. Do you think, so I was wondering about the task formulation. Do you uh, center your context window at a certain point in the genome or is it randomly chosen? Totally random. I see. Well, I, sorry, yeah. sorry. Um, that's a good question. So for the most part, it's random, but specifically in the in most of the pre-training that we show here, we use the intervals from the Bastion G data set, which we, we're actually not exactly sure how they came up with those intervals, but uh, it, it appears like they just kind of stride uh, in a fixed way across a, a given chromosome. So it appears random, mm -hmm. but um, the right way to be to ask them how they exactly, <laughs> what was the motivation for how they chose the spacing and the intervals. But uh, for, for us, it appeared like it was, it was random. And we do, we do have some um, uh, work on the species classification that we sample also randomly, like to actually totally mm -hmm. randomly. And we get similar, similar pre-training results. Um, so it, yeah. it appears it feels like it's random. I guess the reason that I ask, like, uh, just intuitively, I would expect uh, most of the like sequence differences between different species would be centered in the coding regions, right? The thing that really differentiates like one species from another, where there is a lot of positive selection. Um, so I wonder, like, by extending the context window. Are you increasing the probability that you hit one of the coding regions within your uh, within your model context window? So, like, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if that's like a driver of the underlying performance. Like, if you were to center it uh, at a coding gene, uh, would it look similar? Yeah. Or is there like signal really coming from like some sort of intergenic regions or like, uh, yeah? Yeah, that's a good question. That's... Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. I suppose a simple way to to test this, because I imagine curating and like being able to label all the parts of the uh, species, for example, would be could be challenging. But maybe if you just extract only the coding regions, uh, yeah. and just and just use that only and see how the dynamic changes as you see yeah. increase context. Yeah, for sure. That could be interesting. Yeah, totally. The other question that uh, I was wondering. Uh, like I, I find the plot, the perplexity plot to be super interesting, right? Because, uh, having the uniform, if you were like to assume a uniform distribution, like your perplexity would be four, right? Out of four options. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Did you, did so, you, yeah. Do you, so do you we, have any, do, like, uh, we do have, more, we do have, oh, go ahead, we do have more special tokens in there. So technically it, like the initial perplexity is higher, like at the very beginning mm -hmm. than four. I think it's like around seven or eight. Um, so technically, like practically speaking, there's four tokens or five tokens really, because there's an uncertain token too. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the other special tokens kind of makes the vocabulary a little bit bigger, but I, I see your point, yep. Yeah. Do you uh, sort of have some thoughts about uh, this like sort of plateauing of perplexity around three? Do you think it's like, just a hard task to predict uh, like a nucleotide given previous uh, nucleotides? Yeah, so we, we, we definitely have some thoughts on this. So um, maybe I'll just share some brief thoughts on this and then maybe mm -hmm. get to some other questions too. Um, but no, these are good questions. So um, the first is most likely, well, first of all, the human genome is a complex data set. I think in general, uh, it is a hard task to be able to predict the next token. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of variation in in in, in genomes, I think. So the second is um, what we're constrained by is the model size, right? So in this work, um, in our compute budget, we have you know a six and a half million parameter model, which is in the world of foundation models, tiny, right? Just you know, arguably not a foundation model scale at that point. But um, we're we're fairly confident that you know, people who want to create or train a larger 
high-end model, they're definitely going to see a much stronger performance on the perplexity. And indeed, mm -hmm. we already have some evidence of that um, in future projects that we're, we're starting to work on now that suggests mm -hmm. that. Yeah, good cool. questions. That's really exciting. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Phil. Um, let's go with um, De Dennis, Denise. Uh, yeah, yeah, Dennis. Thank you for the amazing work, and uh, I'm really happy that it it is uh, such a tidy foundation model that uh, you really can uh, experiment with on your local machine. I honestly have a lot of questions, but I will maybe select a few. Uh, the first is very simple. Uh, for species uh, prediction, you used uh, uh, training data from multiple species, not only from human, or you only trained for on human reference genome only on human yeah ah, so for this for this for the species classification pre-training was done on just humans and then on the fine-tuning step we do feed in samples of each species so it does have a train you know we separate by chromosomes for each species um, and there's a training set of chromosomes and a validation test set of chromosomes for each species okay uh thank you uh then just a very similar question to the first question of Philip, I think, but um, science, science uh, your model is sort of trained to operate in this long range uh, regimes. Uh, if you use a relatively short uh, context window, do you observe that conditional embeddings uh, for tokens uh, that I drastically. So essentially, depending on how you center on a given gene, you will get different embeddings. Depending on how you sampled. Uh, Sorry, center, that. center, center. Yes, center on a, on a given gene. So so we, we don't center, oh wait, you mean for like getting embeddings? Yes, for getting embeddings. Um, I, I'm not sure actually. So what, 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 what the distribution of embeddings, how it changes as you feed it. I think in general, analyzing the embedding space of the model would be very interesting to see how it changes as you change the context, right? For, yes. for this type of work, we focus purely on, not purely, but um, primarily on on the architecture, like on, on like, does it work on DNA? Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, you know, this is a starting point to get other folks who are interested in to start asking the questions that they care about for you know actual computational biology. Um, by no means are we experts on, in that space. <laughs> and so we definitely rely on other folks to teach and, us about what they care about. Yeah, following from this, uh, a practical question. So what's the best approach to uh, create sort of dimension invariant embeddings for regions of DNA? So basically how to aggregate uh, position-wise embeddings into uh, region embeddings. What's what's the best approach for this model? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure what you mean by. Uh... So, so if I, I honestly, I may not be understanding uh, uh, some of the type, some of the internal workings of the model architecture. But my question is, if I'm correct and the model initially outputs embeddings for each position, so for each token, then for uh, comparing, uh, let's say, different regions in the genome, different genes, different enhanced elements, you want probably to aggregate your embeddings to make them uh, invariant from the, on the sequence length. So essentially uh, project them into one uh, vector that, will, that you will be able to compare easily. So mm. what, what's the best way to do it uh, for, for embeddings from your model? Yeah, this, this might be not just the task for this model specifically, but you might be able to look to other techniques, you know, beyond hyena DNA that try to address the similar questions. So okay. one, one, te one technique that comes to mind is maybe a contrastive learning task. So trying to learn a joint embedding space between things that are similar, right? And pushing those embeddings toward each other. Right, so you might have, for example, uh, different lengths of the same gene that you're trying to feed in, but you want those embeddings to be in the same space. So you might like have a, a loss function that pushes all those embeddings toward each other, and then embeddings of a different gene 
away from each other. So I, I will look into contrastive learning perhaps as, as one possible way. Uh, okay, thank you. And maybe sure. the last question is for uh, generative modeling. Um, so I understand how you can use this to generate sequential data, but it would be also interesting to use this to uh, embed something like chromosome, uh, chromatin modification data uh, for given cell types, let's say, into embeddings, uh, let's say, of cell types or maybe of uh, genes uh, in the context of a particular cell. So essentially, that's the problem of combining data that is uh, like uh, not sequential <laughs> in its structure and uh, not that high, higher dimensional uh, with the sequential higher dimensional data. So if we would try to use a multi-model multi uh, system that combines chromatin modification, let's say, and uh, some, I don't know, expression uh, data, uh, do you think we can basically just uh, use pre-trained model that is aware of uh, chromatin modifications, so basically accepts them as a separate input for each position, and uh, just somehow aggregate again during during fine tuning maybe into this region specific aggregations and then pass them into another model. So essentially, I would say my question is. Is it easy to propagate gradients uh, through your model while using it as a part of a larger system, or will it be prohibitive uh, from the training perspective? I, I I think I would need to think about more the formulation of what you're trying to do, perhaps. So uh, I, I, a short answer is I'm not exactly sure, uh, but in general, I, I wouldn't think of the model as too different from other machine learning models. So if you're worried about um, back propagation through the model, it's going to work the same as other models for the most part. So um, now how you combine them all together and, and formulate that, that's perhaps a wider question about like what you're trying to do um, that maybe maybe you can share offline, perhaps feel free to email me. I'm happy okay. to- um, Thank you. Yes, uh, yeah. I, I, maybe we will. Yes, thank you. That's was not a but super, related question. <laughs> but, but super interesting in, in general, we, we are also very excited about multimodal capabilities, especially in biology. A lot of things in biology represent the same thing. And so it makes sense to combine them, um, yes. especially over long ranges. So we're also very excited about that. Um, Dr. You. Yui, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you for the great talk, uh, Eric. Uh, so I just follow up maybe the, the one that you already touched on in terms of uh, contrastive learning and uh, comparing the same genes of different lengths. So uh, I really like the idea of the gene miniaturization. Uh, so I thought you could do something similar for that, right? So you mentioned that you don't have data, uh, but that's just my view where, for example, you can have a lot of species where you have the same gene that are conserved among species. And then some genes are shorter, some genes are long, longer, right? So can you basically fine tune your model in the way that you, you give the model the longer gene and you ask to uh, generate the shorter genes? Because uh, mm. in across species, you have uh, knowledge about the same gene, you know, translate to similar functional protein, right? That could mm. be something that, you know, as a training data to, to think about. Right? Oh, that's that's super interesting. I didn't, I didn't, yeah, I haven't thought about that. Um, thank you for sharing that. I I will certainly look into that more, or love to hear about that more. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, also, um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, also, uh, like, sorry, yeah, maybe uh, maybe I'll let me uh, come. I uh, have just uh, two short questions. Uh, uh, so the 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 other one is uh, about the soft prompting. Uh, you 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 train the model by uh, having uh, you know learnable tokens in the front of the sequence. Uh, have you checked uh, like what exactly the model learned all those uh, learnable tokens? Does that actually provide biological insight on the enhancer sequences, or or whether there is a tension from those learnable tokens to the the actual region of the enhancers or the actual region of the transcription factor binding sites? No, we we haven't. Um, yeah, I think we were interested in, in doing you know attribution of, of, you know, some of these tokens for 
the other classification tests, even for fine tuning, that I think that would be useful too, just standard fine tuning. Um, but we we didn't necessarily think about it for the soft prompting. Actually, that would be that could be also be really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the interpretability of of these models is something we you know we learned that was very important to bio comp bio people that um, we we did not touch upon. But in hindsight, I think that would be super fascinating. Right. Uh, so one last quick question is: uh, you mentioned the bidirectional hyena. Uh, so you you mentioned there's some improvement that you guys are working on. Uh, so do you like what's the short message? How do you improve it? Like, is there a way that kind of uh, you know innovate you know, on top of the hyena architecture so you can improve just the same way as a bird? Yeah, um, without you know too much detail because we, we you know we hope to add it to future work. Um, it's it's actually not that complex. Um, it's just a matter of changing um, how what we you know. What we add when we're doing the convolution in the frequency domain, we, we just manipulate um, a couple of things. Uh, we basically double the kernel size and then we conjugate it in the frequency domain. Um, but yeah, there's there's a number of ways uh, to, to do it. But eventually what you want to have is a symmetrical kernel. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can double, you know, you can have two, you can double the kernel length and then like reverse flip it. That's one way. Um, there's a paper called SC Hyena single cell hyena that came out on Archive recently, and they have a bidirectional version as well. I think they do something similar to that. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen their code yet, but when they describe it in the paper, they have a, a 2L kernel, meaning double the length. Um, and so that's another way to do it as well. Right. It could be also like a bidirectional LFTM type of, uh, you just change the orientation of the sequence, right? And you have one and then you have the other layer that just go the opposite direction. Uh, you mean of the kernel or? The and like you use like in the uh, later oh. paper, you have just a, you know changing the the sequence uh, orientation where you go with the uh, you know the uh, reverse complement sequence I and see. That, yeah but that's just a more like a heuristic uh, hack i guess uh, for making it by that ratio yeah i see i see yeah that would be that's interesting that would take more computation perhaps um you got to do it twice i guess but yeah and then you figure out how to combine them I guess you can add them or concatenate them. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, very interesting. Good question. All right, All right thanks, Harry. Thank um, you. If you have time, if you have time, can I also ask a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Or <clears throat> right, actually, Jonathan, so how, I, are we doing on, how are we doing on time? I, I can stick around. We, we're, we're, we're fine, uh, as long as it's, uh, I know we're already going over, so um, feel free to answer as many questions, but yeah, I know right. we're already over, um, but yeah, we're okay. good. Okay. I'll, good, try, I'll try to keep it short. Um, but I think, so all is well and good in terms of the theory behind it. Like, I think it's very principled, blah, blah, but practically from a practical perspective was training the models very hard. This is my first question. The second question is how did you determine the number of hyena layers? Because it's a matter of, you know, computational problem. You can, as you said, like you cannot train and retrain and retrain. So how do you deal with the large hyperparameter space and architectural choices that really change the performance of the model. Oh yeah. So how, um, this is, you know, given it's a new architecture, there's a lot of trial and error. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, when it comes down to training models and, and, you know, seeing how, how they scale, right. Um, uh -huh. you can, you can time some principles you know, in your best mm -hmm. guess, but at the end of the day, it is a trial and error process. And that's exactly what we did um, for this work, which was how big of a model can we fit in memory and how long a sequence can we get? So it was pretty, mm -hmm. you know, iterative, two, four, six, eight layers and seeing mm -hmm. where things, seeing where things like reach their maximum um, and, and just doing trade-offs between that. So I wish there was some like magic recipe I had for that. Um, oh, well, yeah. that, that would make sense to folks, but it was, it was really stumbling around the dark a little bit. Um, and so it's hopefully a heuristic, essentially. Heuristic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and hopefully to, to make this process less painful for folks, you know, we do have a, a, a very in-depth readme on the GitHub page for this, this model, mm -hmm. um, that tries to share as much intuition or lessons that we learned, um, and in how to train these things. 
uh, in like best practices. And then hopefully pretty soon I'll, I'll you know, maybe put a blog post on even more depth about lessons learned. And if you want to have certain things that you want to train, like mm -hmm. you have a set of genomes that you want to pre-train and then fine tune, um, hopefully I can, we can walk you through that process and make it as painless as possible. But yeah, it takes some, takes some, some pain to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I am not actually interested in fine tuning, but I am more interested in soft prompting because of the computational issues. Like, how am I going to fine tune a one million base pair model? Uh, I mean, I can fine tune it essentially, but like, did you experiment a lot with the soft prom prompting? Like, is it do you if there's a trade off? Do you know if there's a trade off between the performance of those two? Those two. What's what? What two? Fine tuning the model versus soft prompting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, the main takeaway is if you care about performance, ultimately, like your higher mm -hmm. accuracy, your downstream task, fine, fine tuning still does better. Standard fine tuning. Uh, if you care about um, simplicity and convenience, mm -hmm. like being able to maintain a single model and not having to touch it and dissect, mm -hmm. you know, adding layers and updating it, mm -hmm. the the soft prompting is a very convenient way mm -hmm. to fine tune because you don't have to touch the model. You just change your input. It's a data centric okay. focus, or if you care about generation as well, um, that's also a, a, a way to guide the output of your model. So it depends on the use case, I would say, mm -hmm. um, but the ultimate, ultimate discriminative performance, fine tuning is mm -hmm. your best. Thank you. Um, and what, one more final question for now. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I forgot, but there's another question. So, the, sure. uh, <laughs> so I we, don't we believe can... in sym symmetric kernels, by the way. I think the bidirectional nature, like bidirectional nature of this genome is not going like symmetric kernels, for example, like double exponential decaying centered at a position. Like it's not. So the thing I'm going to say is like, for example, there are transcription factors. And for example, if there's a variant within that transcription factor, it does not necessarily have to be centered in that transcription factor. So if we like go like in terms of bidirectional, like symmetric kernels, it's going to miss out on the, for example, um, one of the, you know, right end, right part of the kernel might have a longer tail than the left part of it, but the symmetric attempts on the bidirectional thing will not solve so, this. So, so to, you know, we didn't dive into the details about convolution too much, but um, even though you have a symmetric kernel, let's say, um, you're not doing, uh -huh. you're still striding over left to right. And then the kernel at one end is kind of wrapping around to the beginning. So it's kind of hard to visualize, but um, it's a symmetric kernel, but the operation itself is not symmetric, symmetric. on the input. Because you're still striding left to right, and so you have this mm -hmm. um, ability to see Aren't both directions, talking... both directions, but not the, they're not necessarily symmetric. So, um, yeah, I think looking up maybe circular convolution is for folks interested. The space that you might want to look into about you know what the convolution is actually doing. So I was actually talking about like I know that for a fact that in your current paper, like um, in order to like make different hyena filters capture different resolutions of data, you are like doing exponential decay starting from a bias, right? Mm -hmm. So like um, flipping that and doing it symmetrically will not help. Ah, in this case. that's what I'm trying. Yes. To say. Like instead yes, of that, absolutely. long convolution weights needs to be like you know. Um, and that will come from not the time index, but individual biological properties of the data, which could be essentially extracted from external data. Like instead of making the long convolutional kernel prediction only on the time index, like there are, you know, yeah, there are a lot of things that can be done there. So I'm not going to get into details of it, but yeah. Nice. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, you, you brought up mm -hmm. a good point about the, the windowing function as well. Uh, and that's why we yeah. we've made a second implementation of the bidirectional to be able to account for that. Yeah, and that's that's probably the main reason why the first implementation didn't work because of the windowing effect yeah, didn't the, work correctly. Yeah, I was really like 
disappointed when I saw 80% over 83%. Like, there is a decrease in bidirectional. <laughs> it does not need that. So, yes. Yeah. Yep. Thank you for very the great good. presentation, by the way. This is a very hard and, like, very complicated topic, but you explained it in a very intuitive way. So, uh, shout out to you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, very nice. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, and, and, and great questions. Thank you so much, guys, for for you know sharing the interest and, and asking such uh, great questions. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and as always, uh, feel free to reach out. You know, I'm, I'm, we're really happy to hear folks um, excited about it as well.